Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure today to introduce Brad Astor from the um, Division of Nephrology in our own department. Dr. Astor is a graduate of Iowa uh, in biomedical engineering and then took his master's in electrical engineering at Johns Hopkins. He stayed on at Johns Hopkins for an MPH and a PhD in epidemiology as well as a postdoctoral fellowship. Along the way, he served as a scientific reviewer and epidemiologist for the FDA. His first academic appointment was in epidemiology and then in medicine at Johns Hopkins. He rose the rank of associate professor, and, and in 2011, we were very fortunate to have him recruited by Dr. Jamali to join our faculty as associate professor with tenure in the Department of Medicine. He's published over, over 200 uh, journal articles, um, and I always like looking at one's first article, and his first paper was entitled Relation Between Gender and Vascular Access Complications in Hemodialysis Patients. So he started in nephrology and has continued. However, he has published in a number of different areas with a number of collaborators, including in the area of <coughs> autism, diabetes, coronary disease, occupational medicine, endocrine, and imaging. He's published in high-impact journals, including the Annals of Internal Medicine, Circulation, the Lancet at least twice, Nature Genetics, and the New England Journal. He's also received significant grant support currently with NIDDK and also in the past, and currently with the American Society of Diagnostic and Interventional Nephrology. Past support has been through the NHLBI and the National Kidney Foundation, as well as the EPA and the AHA. He's been an active teacher at all levels, classroom uh, fellows, PhD and masters, candidates, and has been a good citizen academically, reviewing abstracts for the American Society of Nephrology, serving on the steering committee for the National Kidney Foundation, study of physician recognition of chronic kidney disease in patients with diabetes, and has been a reviewer for the NIDDK for grant review. Um, he is a peer reviewer for 16 major journals and associate editor of the American Journal of Epidemiology and BMC Nephrology. Along the way, he's learned, earned a number of awards, including the Weinberg Endowment Cardiovascular Research Award from the AHA Mid-Atlantic Affiliate. Um, Dr. Astra has given uh, many presentations nationally and internationally from Baltimore to Budapest, and we're lucky to have him here on our own faculty as he presents Grand Rounds entitled Novel Biomarkers for Prediction of Cardiorenal Outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Astor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm actually going to start with a little bit of history, um, looking at some long-term historical trends in cardiovascular disease mortality, and also trends in risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and how they've impacted the incidence of chronic kidney disease in the more recent past. And then we'll move forward and look at some more recent work on the prognosis associated with that chronic kidney disease, especially for cardiovascular outcomes, <clears throat> and how those have, how that work has guided the um, development of clinical practice guidelines. And then we'll move forward a little bit to more recent work on some different markers of kidney function and how we're trying to incorporate those into other populations like kidney transplant recipients <clears throat> and in the future how they may impact development of additional clinical practice guidelines. <clears throat> so I teach a, I have a joint appointment in population health sciences. I teach a course over there in cardiovascular disease epidemiology. And the first few slides um, are some of the first ones that I show to those students, really to try to impress upon them the, the enormous change that has occurred in cardiovascular disease <clears throat> in the past. Um, so this goes from 1900 to 2013. This is deaths due to diseases of the heart from the CDC. <coughs> Excuse me. So this encompasses all cardiovascular cardiac deaths. And you can see there's very few at the beginning of the century with a constant increase up until about 1980 and then a decrease after that. But this does not account for the 
growth in the population. This is just raw counts of deaths due to cardiovascular disease. It also doesn't account for the aging of the population. So if we focus in here where this inflection point is, <clears throat> this now goes from 1940 out to 1992 and broken up by the types of cardi cardiovascular disease. Now this is age-adjusted rates. So this does account for both the age and the growth in the population. You can see coronary heart disease up here peaks around 1965 and then just plummets. It's been cut in half from 1965 to 1992. <clears throat> stroke has been constantly declining. Deaths due to stroke has been constantly declining. Deaths due to hypertension is now a pretty rare event um, to be labeled like that. And rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic valve disease, is even more rare. <clears throat> and these are just huge changes on a population level. You really don't see things like this very often. So I try to you know, bring this up um, to my population health students um, right away. <clears throat> and these have actually um, continued to some extent and flattened out a little bit, but just enormous changes over this period of time. In 2007, in the New England Journal, Earl Ford and others um, uh, published this paper trying to explain this decrease. And they used the period from 1980 to 2000, so 20 years. So during that time period, the age-adjusted death rate for coronary heart disease only fell from 540 to 260 in men. So cut in half again, just in that 20-year span. And in women from 260 to 130, cut it half in them, resulting in 341,000 fewer deaths in the year 2000 alone. I mean, this is a dramatic <coughs> improvement in, um, in this outcome. And then they tried to figure out what was causing this, these big changes. And they estimated that approximately 47% of this was attributed to treatments. So congratulations to Dr. Page and his cardiology colleagues <coughs> on this. Um, and this included um, secondary preventive therapies after MI, revascularization, initial treatments for the first MI, um, treatments for heart failure, and other things. <coughs> they also said approximately 44% were attributed to changes in risk factors, including reductions in cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking, and physical activity. So again, congratulations to Dr. Page in cardiology, the internal medicine folks, the primary care physicians. On behalf of epidemiology and population health, I will accept some of the credit for this. <coughs> um, it's not all so rosy, and the failures are probably on, on all of us too, but these reductions were partially offset by increases in body mass index, obesity, and the prevalence of diabetes, which accounted for an increase in deaths of 8 and 10%. <clears throat> so if we look at the prevalence of diabetes, um, and this goes back from 1958 up through 2000, and this is the period of their study, it just about doubled during that 20 years that they were um, examining, <clears throat> up to about 4% of the population with diabetes at that point. And you can imagine what lies behind this, uh, this yellow box from 2000 to 2015. Again, if anything, just an acceleration of the prevalence of diabetes in the population. <clears throat> and it's doubled again up to about 8%. And estimates say that 10% of the U.S. population will have diabetes in a few years, <clears throat> which, you know, back from well below 1% back here. So again, these are huge changes on a population level. <clears throat> so there's several things going on, um, and this is where I get to the kidney disease. So there's a lot of people that have survived cardiovascular disease that previously would not have. There's an enormous increase in the prevalence of diabetes, which is the leading cause of, of kidney disease. <clears throat> so put those two together, and this is what the incidence of end-stage renal disease looks like. Again, starting in 1980 with about 50,000, 2008, about 550,000 individuals in the U.S. with end-stage renal disease. <clears throat> and the large majority of those are on hemodialysis, 
There's been a large increase in the number of people with a transplant because once they get a transplant, they do live longer than these. So these are being replenished. Um, the transplants still lags far behind, but it does have much better survival. And there's a few on peritoneal dialysis. <clears throat> and this, again, goes up to 2008. If we look more recently, this is from 96 up to 2014. <clears throat> again, all end-stage renal disease has doubled again from 300,000 to 665,000 people um, with end-stage renal disease, most of those on hemodialysis, and a growth in transplant as well. <clears throat> so if these people have, you know, they've um, <clears throat> doubled in this due to both survival from cardiovascular disease and diabetes, this is the cause, the primary cause of kidney failure um, over that same time period. You can see the large increase is mostly due to diabetes, diabetes causing kidney failure. There's also been quite an increase in hypertension. A lot of these people have probably survived their cardiovascular disease that they would not have previously. There's been a little, little change in the other major causes of kidney failure over this time. So what do these people look like when they come in for dialysis or transplant evaluation with kidney failure? <clears throat> this is the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in adults with end-stage renal disease. <clears throat> Any cardiovascular disease, this is hemodialysis in blue, peritoneal dialysis and transplant are sort of selected for the, the healthier patients, but most people are on dialysis, and about 75% have some form of cardiovascular disease when they, <clears throat> when they start dialysis. Um, about 45% have atherosclerotic heart disease, about the same 45% have heart failure at this point, um, peripheral arterial disease, and about 15% have a history of an MI. And this is the same figures by age with 70, 75 or older. You can see 85% of them have some form of cardiovascular disease over half have heart failure. <clears throat> and this is clinically defined heart failure with a uh, previous hospitalization. And blue is the youngest group, 22 to 44 years old. And even there, almost half have cardiovascular disease. About a quarter of these people that are younger than 45 have heart failure. <clears throat> so this is a very sick group. Um, you can see even um, atrial fibrillation is about more than a third of the older people have that when they reach end-stage renal disease. <clears throat> so what does that mean for, for their outcomes? So this on the, on the bottom curve is sex and race specific um, mortality rates by age. And this is the same thing for sex and race specific among dialysis patients. And you can see on general, it's well over tenfold higher mortality. Um, this 24%, it's a little better now, it's about 20% mortality in the first year, 10 times the rate in the general population, it's about a thousand fold for the very young, youngest patients. And over half of these deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> and these data, these come from the US renal data system. Um, so all dialysis, pretty much all dialysis is paid for by Medicare, so they capture a lot of information, which is great for people like me. Um, to play with all these data. And they published the annual data report. This is from 2016. And this is just the causes of death with well over a third from arrhythmia or ca cardiac arrest, 6% from uh, MIs, 55 from heart failure, another 3% from stroke. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different cardiovascular diseases um, among these people. And it leads to very high mortality. <clears throat> so about in 2000, um, Andy Levy and Mark Sarnak published this framework because um, we really started to recognize that, that kidney disease, <clears throat> there's a whole continuum of risk and a whole progression. So kidney failure and dialysis, they show up here, again, 45% have heart failure, two-thirds or so have, have LVH at that point. Anemia is almost universal. Most of them have hypertension. But they recognize that that doesn't just happen the day they come in for dialysis. 
So they set up this framework where people are, are at increased risk of kidney disease, maybe from diabetes, hypertension, family history, or other risk factors. Some of them move forward, progress, and actually have damage to the kidneys. Some of those, actually the damage is bad enough that the glomerular filtration rate, the GFR, starts to decrease. And this is where we really define chronic kidney disease. And some of those with a low GFR actually progress to where it's bad enough, <clears throat> the function has diminished to the point that they have kidney failure and need dialysis. <clears throat> but what we recognize is that these complications don't just start here. There's complications all the way um, in this path. And in fact, if you start here with some kidney damage, only about 10% of that population actually progresses to kidney failure because the risks of mortality are so high as you go along that nine out of 10 actually die before they get there. <clears throat> and that is why, because if we improve survival of some of these, they'll get back in the path and more people have been reaching um, kidney failure. But we recognize that if we're gonna do anything about this, we have to start a lot earlier in this process. <clears throat> so in 2002, the National Kidney Foundation um, published the first clinical practice guidelines for chronic kidney disease. It's really the first time that it had been formally defined and stratified and there were clinical action plans to go with this. <clears throat> so probably most people are familiar with this, the KDOKI, the Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative, is the stages of kidney disease that were in the 2002 guidelines. Um, five different stages. The first stage defined by kidney damage with a normal or increased GFR, kidney damage usually detected by protein or albumin in the urine, and that's with a normal GFR of greater than 90. Kidney damage with mildly decreased GFR of 60 to 89. And then the other three stages, three, four, and five, are defined entirely by the GFR. 30 to 59 for moderately decreased below 30 up to down to 15 severely decreased and then stage five is below 15 or on dialysis. <clears throat> and there were specific clinical action plans that went with, with each one of these stages. <clears throat> and at that time, we used national data, mostly from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, a large um, representative sample of about 20,000 um, adults in the US and tried to estimate the prevalence that goes along with this. Um, and we estimated that about 8 million people in the US, or 4.3%, have moderately decreased GFR, so stage three um, chronic kidney disease. Another 0.2% have stage four chronic kidney disease at this point in time. And these guidelines were full of figures like this. Um, I actually spent a good part of my postdoctoral fellowship making figures like this <clears throat> um, that went into that. And this is just cross-sectional data. This is again from the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, and these are GFRs from a normal GFR, mildly decreased of 6089, moderately decreased and severely decreased. And in black is the prevalence of hypertension. So these people are almost reaching ESRD, 75% have hypertension. But you can see it's highly increased, even with mildly um, decreased kidney function. The next one is um, anemia. And you can see that that also is um, very sensitive to changes in GFR. And we had functional measures too. This is the inability to walk a quarter of a mile. And you can see that even those with moderately decreased GFR, almost a fifth, are unable to walk a quarter of a mile. And it's higher as you go down. And similar picture for, um, for hypoalbuminemia, hypocalcemia, and hyperphosphatemia. And we had a whole list of all these complications um, that went along with decreasing GFR at that time. So the summary from those guidelines, um, and this is, was new information at the time, CKD is common, it's strongly associated with age. There's about eight million people, or four and a half percent, of the whole US adult population that have stage three or four CKD. The abnormalities 
that you see in end-stage renal disease or kidney failure are also observed in the various stages of CKD. They increase with prevalence and severity as GFR goes down, and many are seen once you get below a GFR of about 60. <clears throat> These guidelines had some limitations, though, where they were based on cross-sectional evidence. We just looked at the prevalence of complications at any stage. We had limited data, in fact, no data in those guidelines on the prognosis associated with these various stages. They were also based on a single um, creatinine measurement that um, was used to, to identify the, the glomerular filtration rate <coughs> or the estimated GFR. And there was a single cut point for defining albuminuria, yes or no. <clears throat> in 2009, the National Kidney Foundation funded the Chronic Kidney Disease Prognosis Consortium. Um, and this is some of the group at one of our annual meetings. Um, this has grown now to over 70 different cohorts and 11 million individuals, participants in those different cohorts. Um, <clears throat> it truly is an international consortium. We have a lot of studies from, from North America, some from South America, Europe and Asia are very well represented. We have studies from Australia and New Zealand. <clears throat> We're still missing Africa. If anybody knows of a large cohort study in Africa that measures creatinine and or urinary protein, please let me know. We would be delighted to, <clears throat> to add that. And it comes, we have a variety of different types of studies in here. We have many different general population cohorts, including the ERIC study that I've worked on, the atherosclerosis risk and community study, a large um, prospective cohort of about 16,000 individuals, um, primarily for cardiovascular disease. The Beaver Dam study with um, Ron Klein and Barbara Klein is involved in this. Um, <clears throat> the Framingham study, another cardiovascular study that has markers of, of kidney function. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have some huge studies that have joined recently from um, Japan and Taiwan of well over a million people just in those studies alone. We also have high-risk cohorts, which mostly are trials or observational cohorts of individuals with hypertension or with diabetes or with other um, risk factors, and then we have cohorts of individuals with prevalent chronic kidney disease looking for progression to end-stage kidney disease, including the ASK study, the African-American study of kidney disease and hypertension, which was a, a randomized trial of three different antihypertensive medications. Um, we have studies from Scotland. We have really large administrative data administrative databases like the Kaiser Permanente of Hawaii in the Northwest. <clears throat> it's really a, a huge group. And once it got rolling, you know, at first people were hesitant to join. Once it got rolling, it was kind of bad if you weren't in it because all these papers started coming out and people started joining and it's really reached a critical mass. Um, <clears throat> just one other word about it. It really helps to get the word out for some of these. Um, because most of the people that are involved in, in the education making the decisions are actually involved in coming up with the data to do that, and it really helps with um, reaching a consensus on things. <coughs> Excuse me. So our first study, uh, first publication came out in Lancet in 2010, um, and this was looking at association of estimated GFR and albuminuria with all-cause and cardiovascular mortality in the general population. <coughs> So we had over 100,000 participants with urinary albumin to creatinine ratio, so quantified urinary um, protein excretion. They came from 14 studies. Then we had 1.1 million with a urine dipstick to measure protein. The really, really huge studies have used um, urine protein dipstick rather than quantitative um, protein. <clears throat> and those 1.1 million came from just seven studies. <clears throat> <clears throat> so this was pretty much the money slide for, for GFR, and I'll show several of these um, coming up. 
So what we did, we set a reference point of a GFR of 95. So everything is compared to a GFR of 95, and this is all-cause mortality, this is cardiovascular mortality. As GFR declines from 120, 95, all the way down to 15, and beyond that would be considered um, stage 5 or kidney failure. <clears throat> and you can see that even at a GFR of 60, which is the cut point for even defining CKD, when you have you know, more than 100,000 individuals with the same measurements, it's an 18% higher risk of all-cause mortality. You get down to a GFR of just 45, and it's 57% higher. At a GFR of 15, it's a three-fold higher risk of, of mortality. <clears throat> Cardiovascular mortality is actually a little bit stronger down here and slightly weaker down here. We think that is because of competing risks. So some of these people are dying from other causes um, that go along with really severe kidney disease, <clears throat> but really consistent consistent pictures. And then this is the albumin to creatinine ratio, the albuminuria. And for this, we set a cutoff of five, or a reference point of five milligrams per gram, so really minimal um, albumin excretion. And even if you go from five to 10, it's a 20% higher risk of mortality. You go up to 30, it's a, or 63% higher, go up to 300, it's more than a two-fold higher risk of mortality. And these are adjusted for <clears throat> blood pressure, diabetes, age, sex, race, and a list of other risk factors. <clears throat> Again, similar picture in cardiovascular mortality, really strong association, weakens a little bit probably because other causes of death. <clears throat> and I think it's really interesting that even the five that we used as a reference is significantly greater risk than having no albumin found in the urine. <clears throat> And then we put those two together. We looked at GFR at three different levels of albuminuria. Um, same picture for those with less than 30, those with 30 to 300, and those with 300 or more. Really um, similar curves. So at any GFR, more albumin is higher risk. At any level of albumin, lower GFR has a higher risk. <clears throat> um, similarly with cardiovascular outcomes. Really any of those two or those two really feed each other. They're not measuring the same thing. They're two different measures. These are for the, the million participants in our dipstick studies, which is harder to see, but generally the curve is very similar um, and even more similar for the cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> we have since published um, several other papers in Kidney International the next year, looking not just at all cause and cardiovascular mortality, but end-stage renal disease, which has ridiculously high associations with, with uh, GFR and, and albuminuria. We've looked at the incidence of acute kidney injury. Down here, it's about 16-fold higher risk. And progressive CKD, which we've done in some of the studies. <clears throat> so these, um, so these, so that was funded in 2009. In 2012, based on this evidence, um, the National Kidney Foundation, again funded, now uh, international guidelines, the kidney disease improving global outcomes, or KDGO. And we came up with this, this heat map of, based on those progression, um, or the complications associated with this. And we have this green phase, again, it's GFR, five different categories, and albuminuria, now it's cut into three. And we have a low risk group, the yellow is a moderate risk, orange is high risk, and red is very high risk for these outcomes. <clears throat> How this differs from the previous one, we just had albuminuria, yes or no. Now we have three groups, from normal to mildly increase, recognizing the 30 itself is not that great. But now there's another cut point of 300. And we cut stage three GFR into 3A and 3B, recognizing that there's a lot of difference in the risk associated with moving from one to the other. <clears throat> there's specific um, clinical action plans that go along with each of these. So if you're in the low risk, this is the frequency of monitoring, measuring creatinine and urinary protein. <clears throat> Doesn't need to be monitored in the green risk, in the green boxes, unless there's some other marker if they have diabetes or hypertension. <clears throat> Once a year, we think is fine for those in the low risk group 
twice a year probably in the, in the higher risk group, three times a year for these others, and then four times a year if you're in either the lowest GFR um, or pretty low GFR with a very high albuminuria. <clears throat> we have specific guidelines on when to refer to a specialist. Um, mostly the primary care physician can monitor this unless you have very high GF or very high albuminuria or very low GFR in the in the red boxes. <clears throat> there are a few questions rem remaining after we published all these, though. Um, so I've said that diabetes and hypertension are the major causes of, of CKD and end stage renal disease. <clears throat> diabetes is associated with a lot worse albuminuria um, than others, and we don't know if the albuminuria means the same thing in the diabetics individuals. Um, Hypertension is both a cause and a consequence of, of CKD, so we also don't know if those associations apply <coughs> in that group. <coughs> so the next year, 2012, we published um, a couple papers back to back looking at doing the same thing in individuals with and without diabetes. <coughs> so the blue line is the curve for all cause mortality by GFR in those without diabetes, and the red line consistently above that is those with diabetes. <clears throat> if we use a similar reference point, so they're both put here, you almost super, superimpose one upon the other. So there's no difference in the association of GFR and mortality in those with or without diabetes. Very similar picture for cardiovascular disease mortality. They're right on top of each other. <clears throat> those with diabetes always have a higher risk than those without, but the associations of GFR are the same. This is the same picture for albuminuria. Again, those with diabetes always have a higher risk of all-cause or cardiovascular disease mortality, but the associations are, all, are nearly identical. <clears throat> um, we did the same thing for individuals with and without hypertension. Slightly different picture here. So again, blue is those without hypertension. Red is those with hypertension. You can see that in fairly good GFR, hypertension is associated with, with uh, greater mortality. But once the GFR drops below about 45, actually those with hypertension do better than those without hypertension. <clears throat> and it's more obvious on this side. Cardiovascular mortality, it's even more of the same. Those with hypertension have a higher risk of mortality up until some level of GFR, about 45, and then those without hypertension have a higher risk of mortality. Um, we don't really see that for end-stage renal disease, except at the very tail of, of um, albuminuria. <clears throat> and then this is the, the association with end-stage renal disease, and it's very strong and very consistent for those with and without hypertension. <clears throat> so based on this, we um, concluded that the risk of all cause and cardiovascular mortality with individuals who preserve GFR and normal albuminuria are higher in those with diabetes or hypertension than in those without. The relative risks of the outcomes are similar in those with and without diabetes or hypertension. <clears throat> the results are essentially the same for ESRD, but GFR more strongly is associated with cardiovascular mortality in those without hypertension. <clears throat> and we're still trying to figure out exactly why that is. We hypothesize now that hypertension is really sort of a normal um, process as kidney function declines. So if you have really poor kidney function and you don't have high blood pressure, there's something very unique going on which could be a marker of heart failure or other vascular um, pathologies. So that's sort of what we think we're looking at. We haven't looked into that enough to to know why that is, and I'd be interested in any, any other ideas. Um, <clears throat> so these results emphasize the importance of looking at GFR and albuminuria, even in people without diabetes or hypertension. <clears throat> and they suggest that chronic kidney disease warrants attention despite or regardless of the diabetic or hypertensive status of individuals. <clears throat> Again, these were based on serum creatinine measurements, and there's some limitations to using serum creatinine. It's a byproduct of muscle breakdown. So anything that affects muscle mass will affect serum creatinine 
regardless of the kidney function. Um, we can use equations to measure the, to estimate the GFR, and we put in a term for age, race, and sex, but you can only do that based on the population um, means. The normal man versus, or the average man versus the average woman, the average African American versus the average white, and you can't do individualized ones. <clears throat> so that leads to misclassification um, for people with more or less muscle mass. It also has an unknown relevance for kidney transplant recipients. It may be even worse in that group. Um, they often have abnormal muscle mass for their body size. Most of them, the vast majority, are on steroid therapy, um, which directly um, <clears throat> has direct catabolic effects. Some of the medications that transplant recipients receive can interfere with this as well. So there's a couple different types of limitations. <clears throat> Um, cystatin C um, is one proposed alternative to, um, to creatinine to look at this. It's a protease inhibitor. Theoretically, it should be a good marker of kidney function. It's produced by all nucleated cells at a relatively constant rate. It's filtered by the glomerulus. It's reabsorbed, metabolized. There's no tubular secretion in the kidney. So it's generated and removed if the kidney's working well. Anything that disrupts that will increase the serum levels. <clears throat> it does have some non-renal determinants, but they're mostly much smaller than the muscle mass impact on creatinine. These, the impact of these factors on cystatin should be less. But anything that increases inflammation, including smoking, obesity, steroid use, will actually decrease um, cystatin. So the next paper, and now we're up to... 2013 came out in the New England Journal where we looked at cystatin C versus creatinine in determining the risk um, in kidney function. <clears throat> and at this point, we had 11 general population studies and five studies in individuals with chronic kidney disease in the prognostic consortium that had measured um, cystatin C in a consistent way. <clears throat> Same curve, now in black, this is the curve for decreasing GFR, and this is the curve for um, creatinine. <clears throat> and you can see that there's actually an uptick, which I haven't been pointing out, but we think this is um, higher risk associated with people with very low muscle mass. So if you're frail, have very low muscle mass, you have a low creatinine measurement, not because your kidneys are working so well, but because you're frail. <clears throat> so we think that's what's going on here. But there is a strong association, but in red is the association with GFR determined by cystatin C. You can see that doesn't have the problem at the high levels, and it's much more strongly associated. In fact, this line gets thicker when it becomes statistically significant. You can see the cystatin line becomes statistically significantly different than 95, much sooner than the, the black line for creatinine. And then the blue line is a combined equation using both markers. And very similar picture for cardiovascular disease, where the association with cystatin C is much stronger than creatinine. <clears throat> so it is more strongly associated with outcomes, and we've looked at some of the other outcomes I discussed earlier, and the, the same is true for those. Um, and this is most notably at this range up here. Once you get to really low kidney function, any of these markers um, will detect the higher risk. <clears throat> And this is the association with end-stage renal disease. You get up to a relative risk of 25. It doesn't take much to, um, to determine that. So the risks are similar for that. <clears throat> we also looked at the net reclassification improvement, or the NRI. And it's a metric of how well you can classify an individual person from, and I think we used here, from low, moderate, or high risk. So a lot of people stay in the same category with one marker versus the other, but some of them move. If you compare what, what category you would put them in with creatinine versus what category you'd put them in with, with cystatin. And this metric is whether those, um, those moves are right. So for all-cause mortality, cystatin was better in just about every study we looked at. For cardiovascular mortality, again, it was better for just about everyone really no difference when you're detecting end-stage renal disease. <clears throat> and that 
study actually made it into the guidelines. Um, so cystatin C is the first marker that's ever made it actually into the guidelines other than creatinine. Um, in this one cell, if, you're, if you do not have albuminuria, but you have mildly to moderately decreased GFR based on creatinine, the guidelines suggest measuring cystatin C to really determine where you are. Because if it's up here, you're green. If it's down here, you're um, uh, fairly high risk. So that one category is where we actually suggest it. It's an alternative in many places in the guidelines, but this is the one place where it's actively um, suggested. <coughs> Going beyond um, cystatin C, there's some other novel low molecular weight markers, including beta trace protein and beta 2 microglobulin. Um, beta trace protein is actually prostaglandin D synthase. It's produced in the, in the central nervous system, so anything that affects that production or release will affect this, including cerebral infarction, which could be very important in a lot of the patients. <clears throat> or beta 2 microglobulin, it's on the beta chain of HLA class 1 produced by the lymphatic system. And again, anything that affects that, such as um, cancers, it's also affected by acidosis or calcitriol treatment, which are both common in um, people with kidney disease. None of these effects are very large, but they can um, skew the results a little bit. <clears throat> so we looked at these two markers, along with cystatin and creatinine, in one of those studies in the Prognosis Consortium. This is the atherosclerosis risk or in communities of the ERIC study. It's four U.S. communities, 10,000 um, African Americans and whites. They were 50, 60 to 54 to 73 at the time. We had 10 years of follow-up on these. <clears throat> So this is cystatin C, beta trace, and beta 2 microglobulin. And this is the correlation with GFR determined by creatinine. You can see they're all fairly well correlated, 0.5, not very strong. Beta trace has similar associations with all the others. The one that really sticks out is the combination of cystatin C and beta 2, which has, are much more strongly correlated. And then we looked at mortality in this group over 10 years. We had 1,400 deaths. This is the lowest quintile of each marker with creatinine, um, cystatin C, beta trace, and beta 2. And you can see the creatinine actually goes down, doesn't go up with a higher risk until the very highest tertile of the highest quintile. So just the highest 1 15th of the population. Whereas um, all the others are monotonically increasing and have a much stronger association with subsequent mortality than creatinine does, especially beta-2 and cystatin C. Beta trace is somewhere in the middle of those. Very similar picture for coronary heart disease events. We had almost 1,300 of those to look at. And again, beta-2 microglobulin is significantly higher right away. And it's more sensitive to detect it, and it has a stronger association with cardiovascular outcomes. <clears throat> heart failure, very similar picture. The creatinine is pretty flat until you get very low, whereas creat or cystatin C and beta-2 go up right away and have a much stronger association. End-stage renal disease, again, all the action is down here. Very few of these people end up with end-stage renal disease. But even that, you can see the other three markers do a lot better job of or more strongly associated predicting um, kidney failure than creatinine is. <clears throat> um, we also found that higher levels of, of these markers predict all outcomes in people that, based on creatinine, would have been declared to not have, have kidney disease. And they predict all outcomes after adjustment for, for GFR. So they add information as well. <clears throat> so cystatin C and beta 2, and to a lesser extent the beta trace, they're most, more strongly associated with the outcomes, especially at the higher levels of kidney function. They predict those in those with uh, normal GFR. But you can use all four markers at the same time because each one is sort of biased by something different. Um, so if you put them all in, a, in one equation together, the bias of any one is diminished. And if there's an individual that's, that's frail, the creatinine may not work very well, but the other three may be, may be unaffected. So using all of these or a panel of markers may actually be the best, um, <coughs> the best approach. <coughs> This has since been um, confirmed by Meredith Foster, 
in the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey, a large general population um, study of the U.S. representative population um, linked to the National Death Index, and they, followed, they were followed up for 18 years for mortality. They used a very similar picture. They used the third quintile as their reference group. But again, the creatinine down here doesn't go up until the last one, whereas the other three, especially the beta trace or the beta 2 microglobulin, have a much stronger association with um, all cause mortality and very similar picture for cardiovascular disease mortality. Looks very similar to the, to the ERIC work. <clears throat> so there are specific limitations to using creatinine in the transplant population, um, which I've talked a little bit about. So higher creatinine or lower GFR is associated with poor outcomes in transplant recipients, but not nearly as strongly as it is in the general population. <clears throat> and again, they have, many of them have abnormal muscle mass, they're on steroids which affect the muscle mass, and there's certain medications that also impact tubular secretion of creatinine. So these other markers may really have a clinical place in other populations such as transplant recipients. <clears throat> so, and beta-2 microglobulin may be um, the one to use this. We've looked at this. Successful kidney transplant um, results in a, in a significant decrease um, in beta-2 microglobulin within just a matter of hours. If it doesn't decrease, or if it decreases and then starts going up right away, with, you know, the next day or the next couple days, that may indicate um, that it's, there's acute rejection or infection going on. But nobody's really looked at the relevance, the relevance of these for long-term outcomes. They've just looked at a day or two um, and looked at changes you know, during the hospitalization. Nobody's looked beyond that. <clears throat> so we did this in the, in the Wisconsin Allograft Recipient Database, or WIZARD, a term that I coined and I'm actually quite proud of. <clears throat> it, it took an embarrassing long amount of time to do that. Um, so at this point, we had 2,200 patients that have received a primary kidney transplant here um, from 96 to 2009. We measured beta-2 microglobulin and creatinine at the day of discharge um, and then followed them for five years. Um, a median of five years. We had a maximum of 15 years of follow-up. And during that time, we accrued 400 deaths, 350 graft failures, and 665 total graft losses. Um, I'm doing okay on time, so I'm going to stop for just a minute to plug the wizard study. We now have well over 5,000 kidney transplant recipients that were done at UW. We have our own, um, we have a single organ procurement organization, which means, and we're by far the largest transplant center for, you know, in the state or for miles around. So these people come back here for follow-up. So we have, again, 5,000 kidney transplant recipients. We have up to 25 years of really solid um, <coughs> follow-up on these individuals. They give us monthly labs. So we have well over half a million serum creatinine measurements. We have hundreds of thousands of mineral measurements of calcium and phosphorus and many other things. We have the, the outcomes are mandated to be reported to the organ sharing networks. So we have excellent data on outcomes. So if somebody has studies they want to do in a population like this, please let me know. <clears throat> We've been working on this for a long time. We have it cleaned up. It's a lot easier to use than it used to be, and there's a lot that can be done with this. <clears throat> so, wizard. Um, so this is uh, the distribution of beta-2 microglobulin in the wizard population. The median was about three and a half milligrams per liter. Um, just for reference, this is the distribution in the U.S. adult population. The median is about half that. In fact, our 10th percentile was 1.9, which is about the 80th percentile of beta-2 in the general population. So these are very elevated levels compared to the general population, but there's still a lot of spread that we can look at for, uh, for outcomes. <clears throat> and again, these, are, these people have very high 
relatively high creatinine and beta-2. Um, they're fairly well correlated. It's higher um, somewhat because there's a much larger range, but they're not identical. So it's, there's certainly a lot more information um, that you can gain from this versus uh, simple creatinine. <clears throat> and then this is the quintiles of beta-2 microglobulin at discharge from low to high and baseline characteristics. And you can see that the beta-2 is strongly correlated with almost all of the baseline characteristics that are relevant for kidney transplant recipients. Um, so just to point out some, deceased donors, usually about two-thirds of our recipients get a, an organ from a deceased donor. But if you look at the lowest quintile of beta-2, it's about 30%. The highest quintile is 90%. So it differs a lot by this. <clears throat> um, induction agents, these are the more aggressive um, depleting induction agents. Um, ATG was 5.5% up to 25. Um, Alemtuzumab was 8 versus 41. So these people are a lot, um, had a lot more aggressive induction. The other one, there was no induction used in 20% of those with the lowest beta-2 and in less than 1% of those in the highest beta-2. So it's actually, it's obviously telling us something. And then we looked at the mortality, and beta-2 strongly predicted mortality following transplant. And the separation was almost immediate. And what really impressed me was the separation continues 10 years after, um, after the transplant. They continue to, be, to separate. We started at two years, and it's still significantly a, a beta-2 measured on the day of discharge predicts mortality after two years. <clears throat> and this is death sensor graft failure. Again, an immediate separation that continues, and this is the combination. So really, really strongly predicts um, both of these outcomes. And these are adjusted levels, so we adjusted for everything in that, in that baseline table. Um, so again, a five-fold higher risk of death for the highest beta-2 quintile, death-censored graft failure, fourfold, and the combination. And then we, we looked at all the different um, subgroups, those with or without delayed graft function, meaning the, the graft didn't immediately function, they required dialysis within the first two weeks after, after transplant, um, living donors, deceased donors, you know, just monotonically increasing all of these groups. Those who were discharged early or late, didn't matter what type of induction you got, what type of immunosuppression, really strong in those with a good GFR based on creatinine, and very strong in those with a less good GFR based on creatinine. <clears throat> and then we looked at both of these. Um, so we looked at a continuous association with a doubling of beta-2. So every doubling or twofold higher beta-2 was associated with a 71% higher risk of death. Creatinine, 0.96, so not associated with death at all. Um, and then we put both of them in the model, and the beta-2 got much stronger. It's now a threefold higher risk of death with a doubling of beta-2. And actually, creatinine became protective. So higher creatinine, or lower, lower GFR, now cuts your risk of death in half. And that was very similar for death sensor graft loss or for, um, excuse me, or for total graft loss. So what we hypothesize is going on here is that once you put beta-2 microglobulin in there, that is a good marker of the kidney function. The only thing, the only added information you get from the creatinine is the misclassification part such as, is it malnutrition, low muscle mass, inflammation? So that is actually protective at this point. So you might want to measure both of them, but look at creatinine in an entirely um, different way. And just very recently, a couple months ago, this was um, validated or confirmed in another study, again by Meredith Foster, a case cohort study nested in the favorite trial. The favorite trial was the... Um, folic acid for vascular outcomes reduction in transplantation. So it's a, a large negative trial of folic acid um, to treat hyperhomocysteinemia. 
they select this case cohort study. They selected 508 individuals randomly from the cohort, and then all the cases of cardiovascular death, um, all-cause mortality, I'm sorry, cardiovascular events, all-cause mortality, or graft failure. And they looked at all-cause mortality, again, per a 10 milliliter um, per minute higher level of GFR based on creatinine, no association with cystatin C, each 10 milliliters decreased your risk about 33%, and beta-2, 31%. So it's much stronger, much more strongly associated with um, all-cause mortality. Cardiovascular events, again, creatinine not associated at all, and cystatin C, 0.78, and beta-2, 0.80. And with graft failure, creatinine was associated, but not nearly as strongly as cystatin C or beta-2 microglobulin. So in summary, where we stand now is GFR based on creatinine and albuminuria, we know are strongly associated from these large prospective studies, strongly associated with mortality, cardiovascular events, and kidney failure across a wide range of values. We know that that applies in whether you do or do not have diabetes, whether they do or do not have hypertension. And we also know that the combination of them um, gives greater information than either one alone. And for those reasons, and because we've spent a lot of time standardizing the measurement, doing education, and all this for those markers, they really remain the hallmarks of clinical practice. Cystatin C is recommended to confirm the diagnosis in those where you're unsure, so that has formally made it into the guidelines. Um, what we're working on now is these newer markers of cystatin C, beta-2 microglobulin. Um, they are strongly predictive of outcomes, more so than creatinine, again, for death, cardiovascular disease, and kidney failure. They don't have all the, the weight of evidence of a million prospective um, data points going forward, but that's what we're working on, and the next round of guidelines may incorporate more of those. And they also may have greater relevance in different populations, such as kidney transplant recipients, where creatinine has even more problems than it does um, in the, the general population. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'll ask you to uh, call in the audience. Please repeat the question. Have time for maybe one or two quick questions, quick answers. Better. Correct me if I'm uh, paraphrasing this incorrectly, um, but you're asking whether within those categories defined by kidney function, by whatever marker, and albuminuria, are there other indicators of, of who may progress faster or slower? Um, you know, using all these markers, using a panel, may, may give us some more information on that. Um, there are other urinary markers other than just total protein that may signal specific pathologies in the kidney and that may sort of indicate specific therapies to help those. Um, right now, we really can't say that, but people are working on you know, specific markers to specific, specific disease processes to specific therapies, and hopefully that will, <laughs> that will, that will help. Have to close it there. I want to thank Dr. Astor for an excellent grand rounds. Thank you.